Hello friends. Here is what we read about and reflected on this week in Acts. Paul is in Corinth where the Jews bring him before Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia. But Paul is released and he returns to Jerusalem before he begins his third missionary journey. We read about Priscilla and Aquila who were on Paul's missionary ministry team. They were assistants to his mission and this married couple takes Apollos aside, you remember, and explains the way of God to him more accurately. Then we read about Paul's somewhat lengthy stay in Ephesus. He was there two years, right? And Luke tells us all Asia heard the word from Ephesus. And in that lengthy stay, he meets disciples who only know John's baptism. We read about Paul's miraculous power, which certainly certifies him as a prophet of God, just in the same lineage as all the prophets of the Old Testament. We read about the burning of the books of magic, which shows the success of the gospel mission in Ephesus and of the riot that was started by Demetrius and the silversmiths. Finally, we read an interesting story of Paul's visit to Troas, where he went on the first day of the week and broke bread with the disciples there. And we read of Eutychus, who falls out of a third-story window during Paul's lengthy sermon, but Paul goes down and brings him back to life. Well, I'd like to talk about all of these stories, but there's just not time. In this episode, I want to focus on Apollos and the disciples who were rebaptized in Ephesus and what we might be able to learn from those two stories. First of all, we learned of Apollos, an eloquent man and well-versed in the scriptures, Luke tells us. And the text tells us that he taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, but he only knew the baptism of John. That would be, of course, John the baptizer, the forerunner of Jesus. Apollos spoke boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they knew that his theology was incomplete, his knowledge was incomplete, it wasn't what it should be, so they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. Then we learned of other believers and disciples of Jesus who only knew about the baptism of John. Paul encounters them in Ephesus. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? Paul asked them. No, they said. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Paul learned that they were baptized into John's baptism, and so he explained to them, well, that baptism is outdated now. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. And upon hearing that, those disciples were baptized in the name of Jesus. And then Paul laid his hands upon them, and they received the Holy Spirit, which enabled them to speak in tongues and prophesy. And Luke adds that there were about 12 of them who were baptized and who received the Spirit. First of all, let's understand, before we apply this, let's understand what is going on here. <clears throat> Apollos and the twelve who only knew John's baptism, well, they are called disciples and they are called believers, but they are portrayed as yet unfinished and in need of the baptism in the name of Jesus and in the Spirit. And in Apollos' case, well, his theology is incomplete and in need of correction. And so Priscilla and Aquila take him aside and tell him what he needs to know. And in the case of the twelve who only knew John's baptism, they needed to be informed of the Holy Spirit and needed to make their baptism right, authentic, if you please, now, what can we learn from these stories? First of all, I, I think we can learn this. We want to be people who are always open to being wrong about something that we may think we understand, but don't. We want to be people like Apollos, open to correction. Let's remain open-minded when it comes to our understanding of the truth. There's always room for us to learn more, to understand something better than we did before, and even for us to be wrong about an interpretation of Scripture or about something that we may have believed. Let's remain open-minded, willing to change, willing to be corrected. 
And related to the application that we should remain open-minded, to open to correction, is this idea that what we believe is important, it has consequences. This is a response to a person who might say, it doesn't matter what a person believes. It doesn't matter what one believes. You can believe whatever you want to believe. Well, it mattered to the Apostle Paul, didn't it? And it mattered to Priscilla and Aquila, didn't it? And I guess if I were to narrow this application to what is right before us in Acts chapters 18 and 19, I would say that what we believe about baptism is important. We want to get this right. We want to get this theology, this doctrine right, don't we? But I would expand this to make the application that in general, beliefs really do matter. There is no virtue in just believing whatever we want to believe. So let's continue to believe that understanding and knowing religious truth is important. And one of my personal concerns today is that perhaps some of God's people are tending to minimize the value and the importance of right doctrine or truth. The doctrine or the teaching, and by the way, both those terms mean the same. Doctrine is teaching and teaching is doctrine. The doctrine or the teaching about baptism was so important to Paul and to the first century Christians that Apollos was pulled aside and taught more accurately the way of God. And Paul insisted that the 12 Ephesians be immersed again, this time in the name of Jesus. So at least what we believe about baptism is important. And again, I would say right doctrine in general is important. I think the New Testament teaches that. Now we might ask why it matters what we believe, and at least part of the answer to that question is that beliefs determine conduct. Beneath how we live is what we believe. What we believe determines how we live. So both right conduct and right belief, well, they both are vitally important. The third thing I want to say just here, and it's interesting to me, and perhaps it will be to you too, is that both Priscilla and Aquila are credited as taking Apollos aside and explaining to him the way of God more accurately. In other words, both Priscilla and Aquila, both the wife and the husband in this marriage union, taught Apollos. Now, <clears throat> I guess I might be getting onto a soapbox here just a bit, so I ask you to bear with me. There are some Christians who believe that the New Testament does not allow a woman to teach a man in any setting, that a woman is not allowed to teach a man. But that can't be right, right? I mean, isn't that what Priscilla is doing in this text? Isn't she, this godly Christian woman, teaching this eloquent disciple of Jesus, whom, by the way, the text says was well-versed in Scripture, isn't she teaching him? Again, beliefs matter. What we believe about what the New Testament teaches about women certainly is important. It has consequences. And by the by, you might be interested to know that every time Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned in the New Testament, her name is mentioned first. The New Testament does not downplay the role of women. The New Testament does not undervalue or undermine the role of women. The New Testament does not look down on women as an inferior gender. No, no. It doesn't. Her name is mentioned first every time she's mentioned with her husband. And by the way, you might find this interesting. When translators of the Greek language translate that language of the New Testament into English or any other modern day language, they look at manuscripts of the New Testament. And those manuscripts tend to categorize themselves into certain textual families. So we have the Western text family. We have the Alexandrian text family. Now, what's interesting about that, you're asking? Okay, well, the Western Greek text, which, by the way, is a secondary text family. It's not the primary text family that translators use to give us our English translations. The Western text tends to downplay the role of women. And characteristically, 
reverses the order of the names here in Acts 18 and verse 26. What? Yes, they reverse the order of the names and they put Aquila's name first instead of Priscilla. Why? Because they tended to look down upon women. Those scribes did. Shame on those scribes. And by the way, shame on us when we do not allow women to do what the New Testament allows them to do. Shame on us when we treat women as if they are inferior to men in the Lord's church. Of course they are not. Okay, I'll get off of my soapbox. Let's always remain open-minded about what the scriptures teach. Let's be people of the book who are open to correction, just as Apollos and the Ephesians were. And let's understand that beliefs matter. Let's be students of the Word of God who spend time in His Word, who examine it carefully, and who pledge again to live in accordance with the teaching that we find there. Why? Because to pledge to live in accordance with the teaching of the New Testament is to pledge to live in accordance with the will of God. And may God bless us as we try to understand his will, apply it in our own lives, and live by it. God bless you this week.